not necessarily in all the essential goods that you need for, to live. And the villages and small communities have got to be busy. They've got to produce all the things they need. Otherwise, how the hell can you have a community if it's not busy producing things? Oh, great. Um, I don't see how one fits that together with traditional notions of production and work. I can see how that can be fitted if we can transcend traditional notions of work for pay. Okay. Uh, and I, I, I think, if I'm talking to my grandchild, I'd say, I would hope that the world that you will eventually come to adulthood in may well have got production systems which are sustainable to the extent that they will produce only what they can sell and that you will not be working for wages, that your share of that, the, the payoff, will be a citizen's income or whatever it may be, and you will then engage in what a number of people are already doing. I understand that in Norway, between 25 and 30 percent of people earn their livings in what is called the black. That is, they make their own way by making and selling things in the street, by working in markets, whatever it may be. That they are living almost independent of the major economic system. There are a lot of people doing that here now, too, I know. increasingly. And I, I would see that this is going to happen. The question for me is not that. that. That's something that we'll be able to work our way through. The question for me is how can you produce the sustaining economy <coughs> which is not going to be irrevocably destructive? Well, I, that, um, I agree with everything you say there. You see, if you go back to um, a sustainable farm, say a mountain farm. A mountain, a farm in, in the mountains would require, used to require terracing. You practice terracing everywhere. Now terracing, and uh, if, you're, if you're irrigating your land, um, you need irrigation ditches and tanks or small ponds which need to be periodically desilted, you see. Now all that is very difficult to do when you're working by yourself. And uh, when I was in Illinois, I mean, ten years ago, I was at a small university out there. I saw the farmers there, and you saw one farmer who was by himself, 500-acre farm, was normal. He had no, his wife was at the university I was at, adult education. His children were somewhere else. His parents were in an old people's home. He was entirely by himself. He couldn't afford any hired labor because that was a lot of money. And he was alone with an enormous amount of machinery that he hadn't paid for. No, no, no. And, his, and, he, and he had to cut corners. He could not farm sustainably. It was impossible. You see, how could you farm 500 acres by yourself? Can't do it. And with the, we had abandoned the rotations, had abandoned everything that made farming sustainable. On the other hand, if you've got communally based, family based and communally based agriculture, that's quite different. In the mountain areas where you had terracing, the family and the community would work to repair the terracing and build the terracing. And you try and hire a mason to do that, you couldn't do it. You've got to do it within your family for, for free. It's not against the way, it's got to be done for free. You're part of this family, you work in this family to keep the farm going. And the same with irrigation. If you, once you, once you've, uh, once the family and the community break down, this type of traditional agriculture is no longer possible. And then you've got to move to very much more destructive, chemically based, machine based agriculture, which is destructive and non-sustainable. So the return to the traditional method of farming is essential. It's purely for the, for, for, for it to be sustainable. It also maintains, it's part of the, it's, it's a work that maintains the community. People have got to work, they've got to participate, or the community dies. It holds it together. That, for me, is essential. Now, that's why it's not a question of wages or salaries you're looking for. It is a livelihood. People have got to be able to be provided with livelihood. They've got to be provided with land or whatever they need for their livelihood. And they work, and they work for themselves, as you say. Now, this informal or black economy is going to develop at the rate of knots, because if the GATT agreements, which we've all signed, are going to marginalize three quarters of humanity, which is probably what they're going to do, these marginalized people are going to just sit there and do nothing. They're not going to sit and starve. They've got to organize themselves. And that, to me, is an enormous hope. That is the hope. They will organize themselves and recreate these communally-based economies. They can't do otherwise. I was reading an article the other day about the economy of the Ivory Coast. And there they pointed out, which is one of the successful economies in Africa and West Africa. And there I was pointed out that the formal economy will be providing less than 6% of the jobs in a few years' time. So, I mean, if, if, uh, if only 6% of the people are employed, uh, who the hell is going to buy things in the shops? The formal economy will be marginalized. And people will live almost entirely off the black economy, as you call it, you see. 
Well, that's what's going to happen. And nothing else can happen. It's evident. It has to happen. It's already happening. And people living in Manila and any of these places who survive largely because of the black economy. So the, the economy you're creating, this formal economy, is, is going to, it's phasing itself out. I think Mr. McNamara and the World Bank might let a contract out on you. <laughs> <laughs> when we were talking before, we reminded each other of a movement which has started around Cutty Cutty in the northern Bay of Plenty, about 30, 40 miles north of Tauranga, uh, where there's a lot of fruit grown, and one rather far-sighted orchardist decided that he would not have any pesticides, uh, and it spread. And the latest report I've heard of it is that over half the district has now dispensed with pesticides and with herbicides and any of the other devil's actions Wonderful. that they've gone totally into this now these sorts of things are happening and I would see them happening I don't feel pessimistic about this no, I'm very optimistic about this I mean, yeah. uh, some things I feel pessimistic about but mm-hmm. uh, I can see now a change for the better yeah. this global economy is, you know, it's, it may well solve our problems I mean, as a cost of an awful lot of misery let's not, let's not forget that it's not going to be smooth and there are going to be civil wars and God knows what but uh, you see, what is wonderful is th- this is the only solution in any case to the environmental problem. I mean, if the world's environment is becoming increasingly degraded, uh, in simple terms, it's because the impact of our economic activities on this environment is far greater than the environment could sustain. Therefore, it's becoming more and more degraded. And as we're constantly increasing this impact, and as the environment is kept capable ever less of sustaining the impact, you've got a sort of exponential de- degradation. Well, there's only one answer to this, and that is to reduce the impact. How do you reduce the impact? Well, the answer is you move from a global economy back to the local economy. Well, that's, that's the only way you do it. You're reducing the scale on which our economic activities occur, massively reducing the scale. All take this much lower tech, or much of it will be low tech. You will be getting all take away from these vast machines and all these chemicals, which are extremely destructive. You're going through much smaller scale, much more sensitively. You see? much more, more, more people involved rather than machines, this is a way to, to get back to sustainability. There's no other way. You simply have to return to this local economy. It is the answer to our problems. You're suggesting, I think, that, that we're going to be forced into this and that it is already happening and you can see how it'll go. I, I was uh, primarily a historian and it has occurred to me on a number of occasions that in recent years that Contrary to what the technologists would suggest, the model that we might be looking for is medieval Europe, where you had, for instance, Charles V, who made the big decisions, uh, and, and people in, in the, the whole tradition of the Holy Roman Empire. They made the massive high-level distinction uh, decisions. Down below, life was local, and it seems to me that we are moving into the whole world is moving to a point where increasingly the big decisions, supposedly big with speech marks, are going to be made by international agencies in the big capitals of the world, but life, as lived by most people, is going to find its own level, its own sustainability, its own culture, and that important decisions for people locally will increasingly be made locally. It's already happening in this country, and I've no doubt in others, that Decisions which were formerly made by central government are increasingly being made by local councils, uh, where people have access to them. Now, this is not universal, but uh, it's a very marked movement that's going on.